Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Dan Jurgen. I want to welcome you to the Council on Foreign Relations meeting with Laurent Fabius, the Foreign Minister of France. I'd also like to welcome the members of the Council around the nation and around the world who are following this on live stream. Uh, and to mention, uh, asked to mention that the next meeting at the Council is at 3 p.m. today with President Erdogan of Turkey. Uh, our speaker this morning has a very distinguished career. Uh, he's been foreign, uh, Prime Minister of France, he's been Minister of uh, Economics and Budget, he's been President of the National Assembly, and uh, since 2012, Foreign Minister of France. He also, on the side, is the author of six books, uh, which uh, uh, to add to uh, his illustrious career. So uh, with great pleasure, I'd like to welcome Laurent Fabius. Thank you. I will speak English. <laughs> Forgive me, please, in English. Uh, okay, I've been uh, told to speak about uh, uh, COP21 because uh, France will chair uh, next year in December uh, 2015 uh, the great international conference about uh, climate change. In fact, I'm not speaking about climate change. I'm speaking more about climate disruption because uh, it's real disruption. And it's not for uh, 2100, it's for now. Uh, yesterday there was a demonstration in the streets and uh, it was very chic because I was uh, with Mr. Ban Ki-moon and Al Gore and the new mayor of New York. But uh, what was important is that there were a lot of people and so the world. And I think the awareness of uh, the problem of, of climate disruption is uh, more and more uh, acute. Uh, a few years ago, there were discussions about uh, uh, is it real um, uh, from a scientific viewpoint? Uh, does it exist or not? Uh, I'm not a specialist, or I was not a specialist, but I had to become, because <laughs> if I want to chair the conference next uh, year, I want to know what it is about. And uh, my belief is very clear. Uh, it's an enormous problem, not for the day after tomorrow, but for now. Uh, not only because of uh, environmental uh, problems, but because if uh, we don't do things, uh, it will change uh, in the worst way a lot of things. Economy, uh, migrations, uh, risks of war, and therefore we, we have to act. And um, Ban Ki-moon uh, had a, a, a very good formula. Uh, somebody asked him, uh, well, Mr. Secretary-General, uh, is it possible to have plan B? And he answered, uh, there's no plan B because there's no planet B. And, and I think this one is exactly. Uh, and I ask him the permission to borrow the formula <laughs> uh, because it's uh, not only an excellent one, but, but, but very true. Uh, now, what do we expect for next year? Uh, there will be intermediate uh, steps. Uh, this uh, week is Climate Week, and it's probably why uh, we have chosen this subject today. And uh, tomorrow you will have uh, in UN uh, a lot of uh, presidents, uh, prime ministers, more than 100, a lot of uh, CEOs, a lot of uh, governors, and uh, it means that uh, there is a growing awareness. Okay, uh, we shall have a series of meetings afterwards, and at the end of this year, we have um, an international conference in Peru, in Lima, uh, which is supposed to uh, go ahead. And then we shall prepare for uh, Paris next year. And in between, uh, next March, uh, all the nations are supposed to deliver their commitment to the future. The problem, you know it, 
is that uh, today uh, the risk is that if we are not acting uh, very, uh, in a very powerful way, uh, the uh, warming of the climate will not be only two degrees, but maybe five, four, five, or six degrees. And when it comes to these figures, it's a real catastrophe. Today we already see that because there is uh, more and more extreme phenomenon uh, when it is a question of rains, when it is a question of typhoons, when it is a question of droughts. Uh, if you compare things today with what it was uh, in the previous times, uh, they are more and more extreme. And therefore we have to act in, in order to, because it's the main thing, to go to a low carbon economy uh, if we want to keep under two degrees, which already will be very difficult. Now, what could be a success uh, next year in Paris? Uh, as I see it, we shall try to have four pillars to uh, the conference. The first one, which is very, very difficult, is to have a universal agreement about uh, what is legally admitted and what is not. It's very difficult because, uh, obviously, the positions of the different countries, developing countries, uh, developed countries, different continents are not the same. But uh, if we want to, to, uh, have to keep control of uh, this uh, climate uh, phenomenon, uh, we have to come to an agreement. It's precisely because it is difficult that it is not left to only uh, Minister of Environment, but to Ministers of Foreign Affairs, because they are supposed, they are supposed uh, to be good at finding agreements. <laughs> I don't know if it is true. Um, the situation is much better than before. You have probably heard about failure in Copenhagen and different conferences. But today, the uh, situation is, to a certain extent, better because we have the two major emitters, uh, I mean US and China, uh, which as I see them, uh, have decided to go in the right direction. Uh, U.S., at least uh, the government, uh, President Obama, John Kerry, and a series of, of people, a series of governors, a series of SEALs, have understood what all that is about. And um, I think uh, uh, U.S. is dedicated to go ahead. At the same time, the Chinese authorities... Uh, are in the same mood. Why? Uh, because uh, most of you uh, have been in China, it's a real catastrophe. Uh, and uh, in Beijing and in different uh, towns, it's uh, sometimes not possible to go uh, in the streets because of the pollution. And it's not only an economic problem, but it's a social and political problem because uh, there have been riots and uh, you have a great number of um, people uh, in uh, international companies who do not want to work in uh, Beijing or in some towns because uh, now it's impossible for, for, for reason of health. And therefore, uh, the Chinese have decided, as I see it, uh, to go ahead. And there are conversation between China, uh, US, ourselves, and other uh, partners in order to know wh where is what can be done. Therefore, the first pillar is to try and have an international agreement, especially, say, differentiated, which means that obviously what will be required from uh, a developing country will not be exactly the same as uh, from a rich country. First pillar. Second, before next March, uh, it has been decided uh, at the previous international conference in Varso that all the nations must give their proposals and even their commitments uh, for the coming years, 2020, 2030, and so on. Uh, it, it is not legally binding, but it will give to everybody an indication about 
what is the perspective, uh, how we can remain uh, through national commitments under uh, two degrees. That's the second pillar. The third one is about finance and technology. When you discuss these matters with uh, uh, poor countries, they say, okay, okay, that's good, but uh, how can we finance it and what is the technology? And we have to uh, coin elements and that. Uh, probably you have heard about the Green Climate Fund, uh, which has been decided a few years before, but which is not capitalized. And probably uh, tomorrow, when the heads of state and government will intervene, some of them uh, will say, well, we shall put uh, $500 million, uh, $1 billion. Uh, and the idea, the figure uh, can uh, seem to be enormous, uh, but it's doable that in 2020, uh, it can be when you add public contribution, private contribution, because more and more private companies are going into that direction. Uh, it can be $100 billion uh, a year dedicated to environment and climate uh, betterment. Uh, and the fourth element, which is rather new, uh, is that uh, we shall uh, establish a sort of um, um, book uh, about uh, the actions, initiatives which are taken by uh, local authorities, uh, governors, uh, great cities, uh, private companies, um, financing agencies, uh, economic sectors, going into that direction because more and more people are understanding that uh, it's not only a moral necessity, but an economic good investment, because it's the place where uh, the improvements in productivity uh, and, and uh, rates of return can be excellent. And when you add these four elements, uh, the international agreement, national commitments, finance and technology means, and uh, different uh, sub-governmental and um, um, economic uh, sectors, uh, you have the conditions of success. Now, obviously, it will be very difficult to convince uh, the international community to go into that direction, uh, but it's probably uh, one of the uh, most important uh, challenges we have to face. And therefore, it, it will be my, my final comment because I've been told to be brief. Uh, you can wonder why, why, why uh, asking uh, ministries of foreign affairs to deal with that. Uh, the answer is simple. It's not only a question of, of environmental technique. Uh, it's a question of uh, peace or war, for water. It's a question of migrations. Uh, because of the extension of desserts. Uh, it's uh, a question of uh, being able uh, to give food to people, because if you have uh, five degrees uh, um, um, temperature um, adding to five degrees, uh, it's a catastrophe for all a, a series of things. And uh, therefore, uh, as citizens, uh, it's a real uh, challenge, and uh, each of us in our different positions, we have to consider what we can do. Uh, obviously, and we were discussing it, um, you have to combine uh, ideal and reality, <laughs> because uh, we are uh, doing with real things. But uh, I think this challenge is, is probably one of, of the greatest one which is proposed to us, and uh, um, I'm happy to, to that France would uh, chair the conference next year. Now, uh, last comment on that. Uh, uh, I must uh, precise to you that we have been chosen because we were the only candidate. And, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, it has been decided last year and uh, when we have been um, chosen, 
uh, most of the delegates uh, came to me and their uh, speech was very, very brief. Uh, point one, congratulations. Point two, condolences. <laughs> and uh, therefore, uh, we'll try to give, to forget point two and to stress, to stress on point one. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister. First, uh, I want to join everybody here in congratulating you on winning the competition to uh, have a host Coast <laughs> Cope 21. Uh, as you've uh, undertaken the planning for it, uh, and looking back, as you said, to uh, Copenhagen and so forth, what kind of lessons have you taken from the difficulties in the past to try and get COP21 to get to an outcome that you want to see? Uh, the first time I, I, I went to this sort of country, I was not in Copenhagen, but I was in Varsow last year, and I paid a visit to the specialists with great respect, and I asked them uh, not what could be a success, but what are the sort of uh, mistakes uh, we have to avoid. And uh, at the beginning of the conversation, all of them were very modest, but afterwards <laughs> um, they delivered the same speeches. And I think there are many sorts of mistakes, but particularly uh, two sorts of mistakes. Uh, one of the difficulties in, in Copenhagen is that uh, there were a lot of uh, climate disruption denials. Uh, I know that in US there is still a debate, uh, is it real or not real? But honestly, uh, in most countries, uh, the debate is over. Uh, there is a real problem. And therefore, there is a difference between Copenhagen and now. The second point, and uh, I will uh, learn the lesson. In Copenhagen, uh, it has been prepared. Uh, well, you know, it was difficult to prepare. And the idea was that uh, at the end, if uh, great political leaders were coming, they could get, you know, have a conversation together and uh, find a solution. And uh, they went together. And they didn't find a solution, <laughs> uh, or they they were able to to deliver uh, a paper, but they came back to the assembly, and the assembly said no. And therefore, uh, the modest uh, lesson that I have drawn from that is that we have to have a lot of work, a lot of work, before uh, on my agenda. <laughs> I have put a series of uh, meetings, uh, terrible, uh, next week, uh, international meetings, uh, because everyone has to be able to express what are their difficulties. And you have to take into account these difficulties and to try and find a solution. Uh, but the idea that the supreme political leaders can uh, solve the question at the end of the day, it's a wrong idea. Therefore, we shall try to pay a lot of work, to be humble, modest. If uh, the political leaders can help us by statements, it's excellent. But uh, the, the job must be done before. And it's the reason why uh, this year uh, it's important in this climate week to have a good work. It's important that in Lima, uh, next December, uh, we can make progress and uh, step by step in the G7, the G20, in special meeting uh, to have progress. And uh, it doesn't guarantee the success in Paris, but uh, it will maybe permit it. Right. So you, uh, France has put a lot of emphasis on the financial aspects you did in your remarks. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're here not only in the home of the UN, but the home of world finance. Uh, maybe say a little more about this 
fund, this $100 billion fund, and who, what would be the mechanisms? Who would allocate it? How does the money get used? Well, it's not uh, already very clear. Uh, first, this fund, Green uh, Climate Fund, has to be capitalized. Uh, the experts consider that if we have between 10 and 14 billion dollars by a leverage effect and so on, and adding what is done by private companies, by um, uh, different uh, um, financial agencies, it can come to 100 billion dollars. Uh, uh, and I think, I hope, it's not difficult to come to 10 or uh, 14 billion dollars. The only one uh, country which up to now has committed itself is Germany. They have promised one uh, billion uh, dollars. Uh, France will uh, deliver the figures uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow right. when the president comes. And I think we shall reach the figure. Afterwards, we have to precise the way everything is handled and the way uh, how it goes. And uh, public finance will be important, okay. But what is probably much more important, and there have been works on that. Uh, Henry Paulson has published a report and, you know, uh, when you are thinking about what are the sectors where uh, you can have innovations in the future and earn a lot of money. Okay, you have information technology and all that stuff. But in the energy sector and environmental sector, uh, green growth, there is a lot of, of possibilities which are not only from an economic viewpoint interesting, but also from a financial uh, viewpoint. And uh, we hope, uh, you know, this question of green bonds, this, well, right. you have a lot of things. And if uh, we are able to show to uh, the economic community that it's not only uh, from a moral point of view, if I may say so, useful, but from an economic viewpoint, uh, where uh, there are good things to do, uh, it, it will be a, a done deal. One of the things on the discussion, and I think it's been some discussion in Paris about this, is an international financial transaction tax to mm. help finance that. Do you see that as something that's going to be on the agenda? Uh, it has been decided at the European level, you know that. Not for all the countries, but for some countries. And among the countries, Germany, France, and some other. Uh, but uh, there are discussions because some people say no, uh, it's not a good idea and it will uh, be uh, counterproductive uh, because some countries will accept it, some other countries will not and therefore the finance will go where there is no tax. Uh, at the present level uh, it's not a problem. If it was increased in rate it could pose a problem. Uh, Today, uh, it's not, well, we, we could not have a general agreement on that. In the coming uh, years, I don't know, but uh, today it's possible for European countries, but I think it would be an illusion to hope to have that for the next year. Right. Um, France is unusual, uh, in a unique position among the major industrial countries. Uh, you're about 4% of uh, world GDP, but about 1% of emissions. A good part of that reason is because of nuclear power, 78% yes. of your electricity. Do you see, as you look not at France, but as you look at the developing world and the rest of the world, in terms of dealing with climate, do you see a role for nuclear on yeah. the scale of yeah. France? Yeah, and I see an evolution. Uh, even within the so-called... Uh, environmental specialist. Uh, in the old times, uh, in the old days, uh, a lot of ecologists were against nuclear. I don't mean that they are pro-nuclear today, but there are different elements because, as you know, uh, when you speak in terms of uh, carbon emission, well, nuclear does not produce uh, carbon, and uh, it makes a difference. Uh, there is the problem of waste, but there's no problem of carbon. Uh, France is in a particular situation because it's the nation 
where uh, the proportion uh, of electricity coming from nuclear energy is the highest. It's about 75%. Uh, now decisions have been taken to have a more balanced uh, you know, figure and we shall in the coming years uh, come to 50%, 50% nuclear and 50% uh, renewable and so on. Uh, the figure remains very high, it will be the highest, but it's more balanced. But I, I know, because I'm in charge of foreign affairs, but also of, on, on uh, foreign trade, uh, that many countries uh, are interested today by uh, nuclear energy. Uh, the first one in the future will be China. The perspectives are enormous. Uh, Russia as well is producing, but uh, you have projects uh, in India, in South Africa, in Turkey, uh, you have the particular situation of Japan, uh, which uh, is uh, a nuclear country. You had the catastrophe of Fukushima, and therefore they have to uh, restart uh, the elements. Obviously, nuclear energy is possible only if security is very, very tight, and France is the highest for that. Uh, but uh, I think uh, there is a, a perspective in the future. Yeah. Sure, sure. One difference between uh, the U.S. and Europe on uh, dealing with climate is around natural gas. Yeah. Uh, our emissions are down about 12 percent. A big part of that is uh, natural gas. The Obama administration has made gas an important part of its climate agenda. What's the attitude in Europe about using more gas, developing more gas? In you mean shale gas? gas? Both shale gas, yeah. both in terms of producing and in terms of using gas. Well, um, there are different attitudes and different problems. On shale gas, uh, there are some countries uh, which uh, are, think that it is a, a great perspective. And uh, they are uh, more and more um, wanting to, to go into that direction. For instance, UK. Uh, some other countries uh, had great expectations uh, in the research field, but maybe they are a bit disappointed. Uh, I am uh, thinking about Poland. Some other countries, and it's the case of France, uh, are reluctant about uh, the possible side effects of uh, shale gas. Uh, well, obviously, uh, a major thing is not to be for or against shale gas. Shale gas is interesting at a certain price. Uh, if it is too costly to produce it, because you have constraints of environment, uh, it's useless. And in uh, the territory of uh, US, I don't know what is your opinion on that, but uh, the uh, the, the way uh, you know you have vast territories and therefore you can produce sometimes shale gas at a very competitive uh, level. Therefore, so far as Europe is concerned, I think the attitudes of uh, different countries will be different, but uh, some countries will um, obviously uh, use it. Now, gas, generally speaking, uh, it's a major resource, uh, but and uh, it will, uh, wh where does it come from? You have some countries which are producers, but many of us are importing from Russia, from Qatar, from Norway, from different countries. But up to now, uh, the European policy has not been very efficient because what can be, uh, what must be the aims of an energy policy. A, security. B, uh, the price. C, uh, the fact that it is compatible with environment. These are the three major elements. And yet, when uh, you're looking at these criteria, three, up to now, European policy has not been very efficient. And it is one of the major objectives of the new commission, because you know there is a new commission. Uh, we have to be competitive. 
we have to deal with environment constraints and we have the problem of security, particularly because of the Ukraine problem and Russian problem. Uh, therefore, my guess is that in the coming years, uh, energy uh, question, and particularly on gas, will be one of the major, uh, it will be put at the top of the agenda of all our European uh, countries. Right. Well, I think that provides a transition for us to turn to uh, two major foreign policy areas that are very much on your concern, mm -hmm. one Russia-Ukraine, the other the Middle East, uh, and mm -hmm. we'll start with the Middle East. We'll take a few more minutes of discussion and then we'll open it up to all of you here. Uh, you don't use the term Islamic State. You don't use the term ISIL or ISIS. You use the term Daesh. Daesh. Would you explain why? I think this audience will be very, find this very interesting. Yes, uh, I can uh, explain. Well, obviously, uh, the problem with those one is not a problem of how uh, to call them. <laughs> it's a problem of how to, to beat them. <laughs> but uh, the, the, and, you know, it's, it's an enormous problem because these guys, uh, they are not interested only in uh, controlling Iraq or Syria. Uh, their attitude is simple. Either you are with us or we kill you. And it's not only uh, to the so-called caliphate, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, all that is in the caliphate. It's not only the region, but it's all of us. And uh, when was it? This morning or yesterday, uh, an order, if I may say so, has been given to kill all the Americans and the Europeans and particularly the French. Okay. Therefore, it's not a question of, uh, you know, well, for, for us, the question is to defend ourselves. That's what it takes, to defend ourselves. Now the question of how to you call them. Uh, I think it's a strange thing to accept, to name one's advers adversary uh, exactly by the name he wants to be named. No. Uh, they call themselves uh, Islamic State. First, they are not a state. They have no legitimacy of a state. And second, in French, maybe it's different in other languages, there are a confusion between Islamic, Islam and Muslim. And the idea that they would represent all the Muslims is a stupidity. And that's the reason why, in French, I refuse to call them state and Islamic because it is precisely what they want us to call them. And I refuse that. And the Arab world, which is a bit derogatory, is Daesh, and therefore we have chosen to call them this way. But once more, let's not uh, insist on that. Uh, the important thing is that um, these people have to be fought and to be destroyed. Hmm. A little over a week ago, uh, France hosted a meeting of 30 countries to discuss hmm. this about a coalition. Can you give us some sense of what, what that coalition means and uh, how you see it coming together and what it will do? Yeah. Uh, there has been a series of meetings, uh, one in Jeddah with uh, U.S. and um, Arab countries, and then a larger one in Paris uh, that President Hollande and myself chaired, with Iraqis as well, uh, with 30 countries or entities, not only Arab countries, but countries coming from all over the world. And here in um, uh, when was it? Friday. Uh, we had a meeting uh, chaired by John Kerry because uh, right now uh, U.S. are presiding over Security Council with a lot of countries. And the idea is always the same. Uh, how to cope with this dash problem 
And uh, if we want to cope with it, we have to be uh, the largest possible uh, coordination and coalition. Uh, one or two uh, elements in that. First, uh, they are in Iraq right now. And uh, one of the lessons of history is that uh, you cannot uh, have a victory uh, coming from abroad. Uh, people in the country have to get committed. And therefore, it belongs to Iraqi first to act. Uh, it was not possible before because um, the Iraqi government, as you may know, was divided uh, between the Shiite, the Sunnis, and the Kurdish. And the previous government, uh, who was uh, presided by uh, the Shiite, was very, very tough, particularly towards the Sunnis. And it explains why, when the Daesh uh, came in, uh, they were able uh, to beat the Iraqi army so quickly because part of the Sunnis uh, have a, had an alliance with the army saying, okay, uh, maybe Daesh is bad, but the previous government is worse. And therefore, my first point is that we have to have a political inclusive attitude and government of Iraq in order to change this. It is what uh, is taking place right now, and therefore the first element is to support a political new uh, way. Second, uh, you have to have a humanitarian uh, action because this country and the countries uh, around uh, is in a terrible situation. You have two million people displaced. In, in Iraq, and today it's more than 40 degrees Celsius, but within a couple of months, or four months, it will be zero degrees. And therefore we have to establish a sort of humanitarian bridge with them. And third, and first, uh, we have to have a military and security action. Uh, US and France have decided, because we were asked to do so by Iraqi, to ensure uh, air protection, uh, we shall send no troops, uh, but obviously uh, we have to enlarge those uh, who will be able to, to, to come to this uh, military elements, and it is precisely what we have discussed in Paris, what we discussed uh, last Friday, and I think in the coming days uh, some announcement uh, will be made. It's very important that it should be felt not only by a, a dash against Western countries uh, fight, but that many Arab countries will join us in uh, this uh, necessary movement. So let me just ask you a couple more questions before we open to the floor. Uh, you've expressed concern about the jihadist threat within Europe, within France. Hmm? Uh, how big of a threat is it? It is a real threat. Uh, it's a real threat. Uh, the other day I was discussing with a specialist, and uh, sometimes specialists are right. Uh, you know this famous, uh, well, we can do humor even with serious matters. There was a definition by uh, a French uh, humorist. Uh, what is a specialist? You know the answer? I think everybody in the audience is getting nervous. So. <laughs> uh, the specialist is somebody who is wrong, but along the rules. <laughs> L wrong, but? <laughs> along the rules, uh, abiding the rules. All right. well, <laughs> okay. Uh, forget okay. it. Forget it. <laughs> forget it. It's terrible. It probably works better in French. <laughs> Until now, it was okay with you. <laughs> and now, pop. No. Uh, what, what, what was your what, what was the question? You were talking to a specialist. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. One of and, those specialists. No. 
let's become serious. Uh, I asked him uh, how many uh, nationalities in Daesh? 51. 51. Uh, from all over the countries. Uh, even Australian. I was discussing with my Australian colleague. Uh, Americans, Europeans, uh, French. So far as France is concerned, uh, the numbers are unfortunately impressive. Between those who were in Syria or in Iraq, uh, those who have been killed, those uh, who are right now fighting, and those who, according to our intelligence, are wanting uh, to go, uh, 930 people in, in, France. in France. And uh, a few years ago, it was 30 people. And it is the same in Belgium, it's the same in different countries. Therefore, the question is, how, uh, what, what, what do you do? Uh, on Thursday, there will be a meeting in the Security Council, or in UN, no, in UN, uh, chaired by President Obama about how to fight against uh, foreign fighters. And we have been obliged to change our law. Uh, and you have to have a complete action and a very good coordination between the different nations. Uh, what are the main points? Uh, a, it could surprise you. You have to establish a channel between the families and the authorities in order to make it possible for the families who want it to uh, alarm the authorities. Because you have many families uh, who are ordinary families, uh, not at all terrorists, in which uh, you have a young man, a woman, uh, who suddenly, for different reasons, uh, decides to leave. And these families must be in a situation to give alarm. Therefore, we have organized that. Then, uh, before they leave, and when it is for terrorist reason, you have to stop them. We had to change the law, and now it's possible to uh, cancel not only passport, but ID, any document, in order to prevent them from going there. Most of them are going to Syria and Iraq through Turkey. And it's not necessary to have a passport to go there. You can have only the idea. Therefore, we have been obliged, it's not in our tradition, but uh, you have to act, uh, to uh, give the possibility when there is a hint to stop them. Then you have to have a great surveillance of all that and coordination before, between the different nations, because can go this way. Then, when they are, if they are, uh, in uh, the battlefield, uh, we have to organize ourselves through different means, I will not uh, detail, uh, to have uh, elements. And we have to explain to these young people, especially to the young girls, because you have girls uh, who are uh, 13, 14, 15, uh, who are wanted to, to, to get there for different reasons. But in fact, there are prostitutes when they are there. They are slaves, sexual slaves. It's not at all what they wanted, but they are. And then when they have food, if they have food, and if they come back, uh, obviously uh, you have to punish them, and therefore we had to change the law, because before the law uh, made it possible to punish only if it was a uh, um, coordinate action. Now uh, you can punish people for individual action. Uh, and then if they come back, you have to have a very tight civilians, because these people are dangerous, very dangerous. And they are all the more dangerous than it's a different 
uh, attitude between Al-Qaeda and so-called Daesh, uh, because Al-Qaeda was not wanting to have the control of the territory, and this one, they have the caliphate, and Al-Qaeda at a central level was ordering uh, a series of uh, crimes, uh, but it was centralized, if I may say so. Well, these ones, uh, there are general uh, orders, and afterwards, every individual must act the way they want. Um, which means that uh, this will not be uh, a business for, for two months. It will be a long thing. And that we have to be coordinated and to work together very seriously. And to explain to the population uh, what is at stake. Because you will have people who say, well, that's far away, uh, what are you doing there? We have already a lot of problems. It does exist in France, probably it does exist in the US. Uh, it's not our business. And so on. It is our business. If we don't do it by solidarity, let's do it by selfishness. Because we are concerned. But it's difficult, and especially in these times, we are discussing about uh, crisis, economy, and so on. You know, people are saying, well, it's, it's far away, it's far away. No, it's not far. It's not far. And uh, it needs, uh, on behalf of uh, the government's um, leadership. Leadership. Hmm. Well, thank you. Let's turn to the audience now. Uh, microphones will come to you. Stand, your name, your affiliation, and really concise questions. First question right there. Good morning. My name is Raghi Dadargham of Al Haya. Uh, Mr. Minister, France has been a proponent of bringing Iran into the coalition. Uh, you have had differences with the U.S. on 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 uh, on this matter because the U.S. would like to discuss the regional role of Iran. What sort of conversations are you having with the Iranians about their role in Syria, in Lebanon, and in light of the meeting yesterday, meetings between Pres um, Minister Kerry? Uh, the U.S. Uh, Secretary of State and the uh, Iranian Foreign Minister on one hand, and then the Iranian and the Saudi ministers yeah, on the other that. hand. Are you? Did, did you learn anything that makes you um, encouraged that things will go on the right the, in the right direction? Well, it's a complex question. I don't want to be too long. Um, uh, the question of the participation of Iran uh, to the Paris Conference or to any conference about. Uh, Iraq and Daesh uh, has been raised uh, because they are closed, geographically closed, and uh, they are opposed to Daesh. Um, the question has been raised, but it was possible uh, to have them only if a consensus uh, was obtained, and it was not the case. Why? Uh, because some Sunni uh, countries, uh, you know that I Iranian are uh, Shihan, uh, did not want it. Uh, having uh, the, the, the being afraid that if they participate to such a conference, it could be interpreted like a uh, push in favor of Mr. Bashar al-Assad. And therefore, there was no consensus, and therefore, uh, they didn't uh, come in. Uh, but it is true that uh, because of their geographical position and because of what they say, the, it's the attitude towards Daesh, they, they can do something. Not in the coalition, in, in, in the narrow uh, sense of, of uh, this word but more generally speaking. But, anyway, uh, and that's another aspect, you must not establish confusion between this question and the question of nuclear weapon that we are discussing now with the Iranian. When I say we, it's five plus one on the one hand and Iranian. Uh, Iranians did not ask us to uh, have a melange between the two. Uh, but anyway, uh, we have said, and I have said, that 
these were different questions. Uh, because uh, the question of nuclear is a question per se. And uh, uh, I very often say in, in this matter, and uh, I was uh, happy to say that John Kerry has taken this expression. Uh, well, uh, when we discuss about um, nuclear things with Iran, and particularly, well, there is a difference, enormous difference between civilian users and military users. So far as civilian users are concerned, okay, perfect. So far as the atomic bomb is concerned, no way. And I very often say that uh, it is not possible in this matter to be half pregnant. Either you are pregnant or you are not pregnant. Either you are able to have the bomb or you are not able to have the bomb. And uh, it's a question on which I've always said to uh, the Iranian, uh, we cannot uh, have a confusion between the different subjects. Uh, the, the question of atomic bomb is a question by itself, which is different from the other questions. And on this question, uh, one has to be clear. You have to be clear. We have to be clear. Uh, and we are discussing that right now. As you know, the dead end uh, is uh, 24th of November. And um, we are in this kind of it right now. Right. Michael Gordon right up here in the front. Michael Gordon, New York Times. Uh, sir, um, a year ago, uh, France was prepared to take military action in Syria as part of a coalition in response to the Assad government's chemical weapons attacks. Now um, France, is, France is acting in Iraq and taking military action in Iraq, but it's not prepared to carry out airstrikes in Syria. Can you please explain the uh, change of policy? Um, if it's true that uh, Daesh must be destroyed, why isn't France prepared to carry out airstrikes where two-thirds of Daesh is located? Is it because you fear that carrying out airstrikes in Syria would strengthen the Assad regime by attacking Daesh? Or do you think you don't have the international legal authority to act? And if it's your view there isn't the international legal authority to act, does that mean the United States also doesn't have the authority to act? That's a very long question, Michael, many parts. Yes, but it, it, it makes sense. <laughs> and. Uh, there is no change of policy. There is no change of policy. Let me explain it. Uh, last year, uh, it was in August, I think, uh, you remember that uh, there was a chemical attack, which was proved. And chemical attack, in legal terms, is quite particular. You know that. And uh, we were prepared to strike for different reasons that uh, it is not necessary to insist on. Um, uh, our partners, uh, UK and US, uh, thought it was not possible. And it was out of the question that we shall strike by ourselves. Therefore, it was not possible to strike. Uh, my own belief is that, uh, but it's a debatable point, should it take place, the situation would have been very different. Different in Syria, different for Daesh, and probably, maybe, different in Ukraine as well. Full stop. Different now, in Ukraine. yes, because uh, you have noticed that uh, uh, President Putin uh, has been very active. All right. uh, and uh, we could discuss a long time why he's so active. But uh, I think that uh, maybe. Uh, if uh, you have the feeling that uh, the environment uh, is uh, more open to your activity, uh, you do that. But if you have the feeling that uh, the reaction would be different, okay. Uh, now, 
uh, I take your question today. Uh, we have received, France, a letter from uh, the Iraqi authorities asking us, uh, asking from us to have uh, air protection uh, in Iraq. And we have decided to say yes, according to the Article 51 of the uh, UN Charter, and uh, President Hollande uh, ordered an uh, airstrike, uh, which has taken place a few uh, days ago. Okay. Uh, now, so far as and the, the French president said that uh, we do not have intention uh, to do the same in Syria, I mean by air, but that we shall help the opposition, moderate opposition, in uh, Syria. Uh, now, from a legal viewpoint, uh, and the U.S. has been required to act, and President Obama, correct me if I'm wrong, has said that A is acting in Iraq and will act in Syria as well. Uh, I think it's possible to act. Therefore, the question is not a question of legality, international legality. Uh, but, uh, first, France cannot do everything. And second, uh, we consider that uh, to support the moderate opposition and to fight both Bashar and Daesh is a necessity. You may remember, because uh, you seem to be an expert in that, that it has been the position of France since the beginning. Uh, and I can give you a few Hence, maybe it's a bit longer, but it's interesting from viewpoint of history. Uh, it was my first uh, conference in Geneva as uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. It was in June uh, 12, 2012. Okay. Uh, we were discussing about Syria. Uh, we, the P5 and some other guys. And at that time, remember that, in Syria, there was no Hezbollah. There were no terrorists. And Mr. Bashar al-Assad was close to be beaten. And the conversation between us was, okay, he will be beaten, but uh, where will he go with his family? It was June 2012. And our idea was to support moderate opposition. Because in an Arab country or in any country, you can not condemn people to say either you choose terrorist or you have dictatorship. No. We can hope to have another choice. But unfortunately, uh, the moderate opposition has not been supported really. And eight months later, there were Hezbollah, there were Iranians, there were terrorists, and there was a bit a great difficulty, and obviously Mr. Bashar was stronger. Then came the episode of the chemical weapons, and okay. Now, what do we have to do? Uh, we have, obviously, but I mean, it's not only France, uh, it's a large coalition. Uh, action must be taken against Daesh in Iraq and in Syria because they can go to Syria. Okay. But action must be taken against Bashar as well. And anyway, the opposition must be supported. It must be supported in terms of means, of finance, and action and training, all that. And France has said that in Iraq we shall have air protection, and in Syria, we shall support the moderate uh, opposition. That's our position. There's no shift. Uh, 
Mr. Minister, uh, in one of the great statements about diplomacy, you said we, recently we must stay in the realm of reality. <laughs> I'm afraid that we also must stay in the realm of time. <laughs> and I want to apologize to the many people who had their hands up for questions, but the minister has a very tight schedule. So I think we'll have to conclude now. I'd like to ask you all to stay seated while the minister leaves and just to say uh, thank you to the, all of us watching on stream and all gathered here. Please join me in thanking you. Thank you.